Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about prehension, handwriting, and bimanual coordination skills and the characteristics of those skills. Um, so beginning with prehension, um, so that's just a fancy word to describe actions that involve reaching for and grasping objects. So anytime like you reach and pick up a cup off of the table or you reach out and pet a dog. So any action that involves the reaching for and then some kind of touch or manipulation of an object uh, that's referred to collectively as prehension. So there are three components of a prehension movement. Um, so the first is transport. So it's the movement of the arm uh, carrying the hand towards the object that you're going to interact with. Uh, the second component is the grasp. So the closing of the hand on the object. And that can look differently. Like that could be picking up a glass from the table or it can be petting a dog or you know, scratching a dog's head or whatever. It can look like all sorts of things. And then object manipulation is the third component and that's the functional goal for the prehension action. Um, so the object manipulation is actually very important because if we look at how transport and grasp change depending on what the manipulation is, um, they're, they're all very interdependent. So all three components are going to be affected depending on what the goal is of the action. So even if the object is a glass of water on the table, um, if the object manipulation is different, like maybe in one case we're going to reach and drink from the glass, and in another we're going to reach and move the glass from one place to another on the table, the transport and grasp components are going to look differently for those two actions. Um, because the transport and grasp are going to depend on what the manipulation is that is going to be done with that object. Um, so prehension actions are a type of speed and accuracy skill. So um, in the last video, we talked about Fitts law, uh, where we see that speed and accuracy, there's a trade-off between the two. So um, if we want to prioritize speed, we're going to be less accurate. If we want to prioritize accuracy, we're going to be slower. Um, so Fitts law applies to prehension, um, and then it applies in a laboratory setting and it applies in activities of daily living. Um, but the difference between prehension type activities compared to just a manual like target touch sort of thing, like where you reach out and you're just touching something, the difference is the object manipulation once you get there. Um, so Fitts law still applies, but you have to actually use a much more complex version of Fitts law because you have to take into consideration um, the different characteristics of the manipulation and the task. So you would actually use a more complicated, more advanced version of Fitts law equation to calculate the difficulty for a different type of activity with prehension, uh, because like there's a big difference between reaching and picking up an empty coffee mug off the table versus picking up a coffee mug that's filled to the brim and you're trying not to spill it. Um, so the characteristics of the object manipulation in those two examples are very different and significantly changes the, the difficulty of, of each task. Um, vision is important during the transport and grasp phases, um, but once you've grasped the object, it's not necessarily important for the object manipulation, depending on what the features are of the object manipulation. So like if I reach and pick up an empty coffee mug, vision isn't going to be important once I have made the grasp. So I've reached my target. I don't have to look to pick up and then drink from it. Maybe it's empty. Maybe it only has a little bit in there. Um, so I don't have to look to pick it up and move it around or do whatever I'm doing. Um, but if it's filled to the brim, then vision is going to continue to be important because I need to maintain visual contact to get that visual feedback about how successfully I'm completing the task. So like you're gonna look very intensely, <laughs> very intently at your coffee as you're bringing it towards your mouth to, to lower the level of the coffee and make sure that you're not spilling it. Uh, transport and grasp phases are controlled in the same way as other speed accuracy tasks. So preparation, open loop and closed loop. Um, and during the grasp phase, vision supplements tactile and um, vision supplements tactile and proprioceptive feedback to meet the needs of the grasp and prepare for manipulation. So basically, 
when you grasp the object, you're using all three types of feedback. So visual feedback, uh, tactile feedback, and proprioceptive feedback all to meet the needs of the grasp and then uh, to prepare for the object manipulation, depending on what it is for that task. Uh, prehension skills are enhanced by using binocular vision and central vision. Um, so when we are reaching and grasping, the grasping portion especially, we are generally looking directly at that object using central vision. And if we're using monocular vision, meaning like one eye is obscured or we're only using one eye instead of two, uh, then that significantly affects our accuracy in most cases um, because we lose a lot of depth perception and have a, a more difficult time of estimating our time to contact or our tau. Um, so in practice, our transport grasp and object manipulation components of the movement are very interdependent, so they're highly related. Um, so when we are practicing, so like for in a rehabilitation setting or um, any kind of setting where we're learning some kind of prehension task, um, it is not useful to separate the three components. So it's not useful to practice transport only or grip, grasp only or object manipulation only without the other components. Um, so it's most beneficial to practice functional activities that include all three components. Um, and then because how we control the movement varies so significantly based on the characteristics of the specific task, it's really useful to practice in a lot of different ways. So use different objects with different characteristics and different goals. So like it's different, it's a different task to move the coffee mug from one place to another on the table compared to picking up the coffee mug to drink from it. And then it's a different task if it's filled to the brim versus if it's only half full. Um, so it's beneficial to practice prehension tasks with all sorts of different characteristics because that's gonna be an entirely different control mechanism for each one. All right, handwriting. Um, so there's something called motor equivalence, which refers to the capability of the motor control system to enable a person to achieve an action goal in a variety of situations and conditions. Um, what that means in this context is that handwriting is not specific to certain muscles or joints or motion patterns that handwriting is more of like an abstract um, thing that's sort of held in the brain and we can execute that um, in, with lots of different limbs and in all sorts of different ways. It won't look as good, <laughs> you know, if, like if you're writing with your toes, it's not gonna look as good as if you're writing with your dominant hand um, or even if you're writing with your non-dominant hand compared to your dominant. I won't look the same, it won't look as good because you don't have as much practice and repetition with those muscles and joints. Um, but the point is that we have motor equivalence, which is that we can execute the action in many different ways on many different situations. You can write really big, you can write really small, you can write with all sorts of different writing tools and things. Um, so you can adapt the specific demands of the writing context. So uh, the size, the force, direction, muscle involvement. Um, like it, it may not seem that way, but just depending on what kind of writing instrument you're using, you're going to have to use different sorts of muscles and amounts of force. Like think about writing with a crayon versus writing with a pen it's a little bit different because you have to press a little harder and, and write at the correct angle and all that to be able to write with a crayon uh, compared to when you're writing with a pen. Um, so there are many different control processes that are part of handwriting. It's a very uh, complex process that is both cognitive and motor that have to all happen all at the same time. Um, so for one, you have to think about what it is that you're actually writing. So memory retrieval of words that convey the meaning that, you're, that you intend for what you're writing. Um, then you have to be thinking about grammatical construction and spelling. Um, there's another layer of complexity if you're writing in a language that isn't your first language. So you might have another layer of complexity there with uh, sentence construction and word selection and so on. Um, and then there's the motor components, the movement of the limb to produce the correct letters of the appropriate size and shape, and the holding of the writing instrument with the appropriate amount of force. 
Um, so you don't want to hold the instrument with too much force or not enough um, because then you're not going to be able to control it in the same way um, and, and be able to accurately write the words that you're trying to write. So vision is really important in handwriting. Um, of course, we know we can write without looking. So like if you've ever been in class and you're trying to write as fast as you can, looking at the board and writing in your notes, you know, we all try to write without looking. Um, but when we're not looking, uh, we produce a lot more errors than we produce when we are looking. So like we will have extra or omitted strokes, duplicate letters and all sorts of other errors. Um, it also like imagine, it, it, like you could write without looking for a line, but then how do you even start the next line in the correct place and get the spacing right if you're not looking? So vision is really important. Um, so there's two big functions of vision in handwriting. Um, one is the control of the overall spatial arrangement of words on a horizontal line. So being able to write on in a straight line, whether there's lines or not on your paper is not, it doesn't matter, but being able to write straight across in a line and then being able to go to the next line and write straight across. So we need vision to be able to control that spacing. Uh, but then also being able to produce accurate handwriting patterns. So being able to produce the appropriate strokes and letters um, we make far fewer errors when we are looking while we're writing. All right, so finally, by manual coordination. So that's referring to the patterns of coordination when we're using two hands to do something, or we could be looking at two feet, but by manual, by definition, we're looking at hands. Um, so we automatically do things in symmetrical patterns. So it's like built into us that we prefer symmetrical patterns and symmetrical movements. So we look in this picture here, in phase means that the hands are doing something symmetrically. So they're doing the same thing at the same time in opposite directions because it's symmetrical, but like wrist flexion, wrist extension, we're doing the same thing at the same time that's in phase. Antiphase means that the hands are doing opposite things at the same time. So like in this example, my right wrist is in flexion and my left wrist is in hyperextension and then vice versa. So that's antiphase. So that would not be symmetrical. They're not doing the same thing at the same time. Um, so like symmetrical bimanual coordination would be like rowing a boat. We're doing the same thing at the same time with the two hands. Asymmetrical bimanual coordination is where our two arms are doing different things at the same time. So like playing a guitar is a great example. Uh, so in, when you're playing a guitar, you've got one hand holding the strings or making the chords, and then the other hand is strumming and, and playing the music. So the two hands are doing entirely different activities. So that's asymmetrical, uh, but it's still coordinated because you're still coordinating what your two hands are doing. They're just doing two different things at once. Um, so our motor control system prefers symmetry. We default to doing things symmetrically. Like my kids, I have, a, I have two teeny little kids and they're working on the, the motor skill of brushing their teeth. You know, it's not an easy thing. We take it for granted, but when you're really little, that's a new thing. And it's really funny when, he, when my oldest was first learning, he would go like this when he was brushing. So he'd brush his teeth with one hand, but his other hand would do the symmetrical movement, even though it wasn't involved. He wasn't trying to brush with both hands. It was just, he couldn't help but flap his other arm around while he did the, the brushing. Um, and so our, we automatically prefer symmetry and we default to symmetry and we have to unlearn symmetry to be able to do things in asymmetrical ways. So asymmetrical movements are more challenging and take more practice and time to learn how to do things with just one hand or where two hands are doing opposite or very different things. Uh, it's not clear how we actually do that. It's not clear how we control two hands doing the same or different things. Um, but the two arms are coupled into coordinative structures automatically that prefer symmetry. So we have to undo that and overcome it and create new coordinative structures for asymmetrical movements. Um, let's see, I kind of just said all that. All right, so if we look at our motor program theory, the way that theory would view bimanual coordination is that there could be a generalized motor program developed per arm 
or for the whole motion for two arms that are working asymmetrically. So there's disagreement in the community that subscribes to motor program theory. There's disagreement among them about whether it be one GMP that's governing the whole bimanual action or whether there would be two, one for each arm that are governing the two different actions. Um, if somebody subscribes to the dynamical systems theory view, um, then we would look at it as a symmetrical coordination is an attractor state. So we automatically very comfortably go into symmetrical coordination. Um, and then with practice though, when we do it a lot and with practice and repetition, we can create new attractor states out of asymmetrical movement patterns. So like by the time you're an adult brushing your teeth, it's very easy to just do it with one hand because you've created a new attractor state because you have had so much time and practice and repetition with that action. All right, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.